Focus. Ideate. Innovate. Enable. Forbes India, CNBC TV 18 present India Inc. on the move. Sustainable manufacturing. Powered by Rockwell Automation. In the previous episode, we embarked on a conversation centered around sustainable manufacturing. Get ready for another exciting episode as Forbes India and CNBC TV 18 present India Inc. on the move. Sustainable manufacturing. The new paradigm for growth. Powered by Rockwell Automation. The day-long conclave brought together manufacturing visionaries and stakeholders, igniting a transformative dialogue. They shared profound insights and strategies during various panel discussions aimed at positioning India at the forefront of sustainable manufacturing. The event further showcased an exhibition to feature the whole range of products and services that contribute to foster the sustainable manufacturing practices. Moderated by CNBC TV 18's Sonal Bhutra, the esteemed panel of experts delve into the subject of zero waste manufacturing. Uh, Mr. Ghosh, let me start with you. Um, what does green manufacturing entail? Uh, what kind of changes are you seeing India Inc. make? And uh, is it fast enough now? Thank you for the question. Let's start with the last one because it's the easiest one to answer. Is it fast enough? We'll never say yes to this for at least the next 10 or 15 years. Yeah. It can always be faster. But what is it all about? Let's take a step back. The problem we are trying to solve with climate is a problem of egregious pollution. Whatever we do, whether it is manufacturing, drive a car, wear clothes, there is pollution involved in it somewhere. And that's what we're trying to solve for. So when we say green manufacturing, we're actually trying to get to a stage where we will manufacture, but we will not add to the pollution burden of the world. So in green manufacturing, figuring out ways by the waste doesn't go to landfill, and then ensuring that you create value out of waste is another very critical part to do. If you do these two, you've tackled a large part of the problem as a manufacturing hit. There's much more, but I'm sure it'll come out in the course of the discussion. Oh, yes, but well, that's a great start to this uh, conversation, Mr. Chaji. Let me come to you, and uh, then I'll come to you, Mr. Kulkarni, because uh, when we talk about green manufacturing here, we're also talking about waste that is generated, right? How do we navigate around that? How are companies like yourself and you, Mr. Kulkarni, working on that? And uh, what do you mean uh, by the term when we say circular economy and green manufacturing here? I think circular economy is uh, not just recycling waste. It starts with actually reduction and elimination. And the next step is reuse. The next step is redesign. And then we go to recycling. First, we should always try to reduce, reuse, repair things. And then we go for recycling. When we discuss about the green manufacturing, uh, it is not uh, just what kind of products we are producing, but uh, how we produce it. So both of the things are important uh, in this uh, journey. People consider recycled products as inferior quality products, as well as uh, something cheap, which will have a lot of problems, that kind of attitude. So we, uh, as a company, we needed to work a lot on the, those aspects. We worked a lot to convince our customers that recycled is not a inferior quality. It is a good quality, as good as any other polyester uh, in the world. Mr. Muldridge, let me come to you. Uh, because we talk about a lot of other aspects of green manufacturing, but technology is important there as well. How are you at Rockwell planning that? Um, are your clients coming to you and talking about changing their systems, changing the way they manufacture? Uh, what is the sense right now on the ground? Yeah, I think there's a definite trend towards looking at how to make manufacturing more sustainable. And it's not just in one area. And when our clients talk to us about sustainability, they talk really about the three aspects of ESG, environmental, social governance. I think in general, consumers demand a certain standard of product. They're not going to choose green over a product that doesn't function as they expect. Sustainability is not something you wake up tomorrow and you have the perfect outcome because standards change. So it's a journey that you need to take over a period of time. 
If only things work like that, right? That's not possible. But of course, as all of you have been pointing out, it's a journey that India and companies and stakeholders are towards and working on that. Um, Mr. Narayanan, let me come to you. Because last couple of months, one word that Mumbai spoke about was AQI, high AQI. And that has been the big talking point. Uh, you drive solutions, you um, work around it, you have the technology to do that. Tell me how important is technology in not talking about the qualitative part of uh, sustainability, but the quantitative part as well. Put a measurement mechanism in place. So what we do even for the industry is the same. We say that, okay, first you need to establish a baseline by doing an audit of your net zero and come to a carbon accounting itself to say what is your scope one, scope two, and scope three, and where is the problem. And from there, we start driving it. So that's kind of how I think the technology can start driving the first part of it. He's saying, at least let's measure and at least acknowledge that there is a problem. And then we start from the next stage that once the problem is acknowledged, the solution starts from there. How are, first of all, are companies ensuring that their supply chain is also green? Will that cause some sort of disruption? And what are the challenges to green transition in that case? The generic answer to the question is large OEMs work with their suppliers, do a lot of capacity building, just as we've done in the Mahindra Group for some, I don't know, 15 years. We've been training them on the things that we have done in our factories already and replicating it in their factories. Mr. Kulkarni, a similar question to you. You had a different view, but trying to understand how the cost economics works when uh, you move to a greener manufacturing uh, system. See, when uh, you uh, move to a green manufacturing system, particularly when you are replacing some of the conventional manufacturing methods, in some part, obviously, there would be a, a capex question that will come into the picture because some of the new technologies cost more to begin with. Over a period of time, if you look at it, uh, definitely then the cost will go down. At Revalue, we are looking at, in fact, doing the same thing. We are looking at producing a polyester polymer using the waste material at a cost which is equivalent to virgin petrochemical product. So that is our aim. And then we are adding if we can produce lowest carbon footprint while doing that. And that will create a value for us. And that is getting uh, becoming attractive for a lot many brands uh, and that is creating a value for us. Beyond the panel discussion, the conclave featured a diverse range of rooms, each offering unique presentations and engaging discussions. Attendees had the opportunity to explore topics such as maintenance strategy, industrial edge management and numerous other cutting-edge subjects. I'm happy that Rockwell Automation has taken this initiative. Uh, we have been closely related because we have been working on some manufacturing automation with them. Uh, but th these kind of events actually get all the stakeholders here together. Uh, India, is, India is still learning a lot about ESG, sustainable manufacturing, but we are, we are technology-wise, we are way ahead. So we can leapfrog those stages that are there and maybe come at par at uh, some things with Europe and US as well. Sustainable manufacturing is the future of manufacturing. Unless, unless we go towards sustainable manufacturing, no business would be viable. Okay, so digitalization is one of the key trend which we, we look for in sustainable manufacturing. Forbes India, CNBC TV18 present India Inc. on the move. Sustainable manufacturing, powered by Rockwell Automation. Forbes India, CNBC TV18 present India Inc. on the move. Sustainable manufacturing, powered by Rockwell Automation. Continuing the enriching discussions, CNBC TV 18's Reema Tendulkar hosted a panel that explored the topic of securing OT environment in the digital age. So as the panel suggests, how do you secure your operational technology environment in a digital age? And I've got a great panel with me, all from the manufacturing space. So this is where uh, the focus is going to be. Uh, Mr. Sharma, this first question is for you. You have one of the most complex operations, right, Tata Motors. You have seen the migration from legacy systems to now new age uh, systems, you know, top of the line manufacturing facilities. You have operations geographically spread in India, Asia, Africa. Can you talk about uh, how do you secure your operational technology 
in today's digitized age? So as far as OT is concerned, so uh, it is completely different from the generic IT network. Okay. And uh, as far as we are concerned, so we have isolated network for complete OT as a whole. And uh, in order to secure it or safeguard it, so we have different uh, controls in place uh, at each and every stage. But of course, if you see the posture of uh, manufacturing industry in India or across the globe, so there are a few legacy systems which are still present in the environment. That is the biggest, biggest challenge today in order to uh, remediate it or in order to discover it. Discovery is the foremost thing which people have to consider. How difficult is it, uh, you know, Mr. Bedinathan, to get visibility on your assets? Because as we've been pointing out, for most companies, enterprises, assets are spread across the world. These are complex assets. They're legacy assets. How difficult is it to start with the first step of identifying the vulnerabilities, the visibility of your OT assets? Yeah, so just to add on that part, if you see, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, prioritization, that is uh, very important to understand that OT infrastructure works in a different manner. We need to understand that uh, there are certain la uh, layers on which a OT system works in a cohesive manner. So starting from layer 0 to layer 1 to layer 3.5 till industrial DMG creation, we need to understand how we are going to converge with IT systems. Uh, particularly when we talk about the identification of the vulnerabilities, uh, most important thing is to identify the vulnerabilities in labels. When I talk about the labels, it starts from level one, where you do the proper vulnerability assessments. Level two talks about penetration testing to understand whether those are intrusive or not. So that is particularly, you have to differentiate between the vulnerabilities from intrusive and non-intrusive point of view. Would you like to add anything? What are the big challenges in implementing and making sure the operations are secure that you face? The biggest challenge for any security person uh, securing OT system is the people aspect, right? The people who are managing those OT systems and manufacturing the operators who's monitoring the entire systems, right? They need to be very well aware, at least a basic understanding of what we are doing, why we are doing. Because that's the, they're the people who drive everything. So unless we don't get and so it's a, it's a collaboration, right? So their buy-in is very important. The people or the engineering team, the instrumentation team, because they know the system better than us, right? But we are helping them in order to make their job more effective. Open-ended question. Any other changes to the you know, team or leadership that we require to make sure we can implement this smoothly? Cross-functional teams, communication, anything else? I think, I think uh, what uh, my friend mentioned regarding people is very important. Because I think if, again, if I'm comparing IT to OT, IT is very centralized, which means I can have a good team in one centralized place, which we are able to react to different, I would say, attacks or different defense me me methods in different areas. In OT, it's different. It's physical world. It's islands. Okay, we have island with people, okay, which is setting geographically in a very far, way, uh, far place and they need to react to an incident, okay? An incident can come, even if it's closed, it can come from a USB, it can come from a mistake that somebody did. So training the people and getting our champions, okay, in the right place, okay, which are able to react to the first attack and uh, know how to do that, this is very important. And I think organizations are getting into tools, into uh, devices and adding all kinds of things, but we need to invest in our people and we need to train it correctly. Would you like to tell us how Rockwell is differentiating or positioning itself? So I think for the last five years, Rockwell did a lot of investment in cybersecurity. One of the things that they, they did, they acquired different companies. I'm one of them. I came from Israel from a company called Avnet, which has a, a vast uh, experience in the cybersecurity, both in the IT and the OT, which is very important. Because when you understand how attacks are caused and we understand 
how attackers coming from the IT to the OT, you are able to defend against this kind of attack. So Rockwell invested in us and bought us, and he, he, she acquired another company. In Euler, we have our NSS group, which is internal group, which is dealing with cybersecurity. And all of this is giving us, I think, an advantage of how we are looking on threats that are focusing into the OT environment, and how we are solving the challenges that are needed to be done in order to cope with the different uh, threats that we are seeing. Further, the Conclave brought together a panel of industry experts to engage in active conversations centered around envisioning a future-proof chemical industry, moderated by CNBC TV 18's Madhu Bhandari. With a little bit of a focus on environmental, social and governance goals, uh, ESG goals that are a mandate for almost every organization across the board around the world today. Uday, if I can begin with you, uh, you know, what are the chemical manufacturers' challenges when it comes to complying, especially with environmental goals? So, you know, there are three types of uh, regulations are there, environmental regulations. One is procedural regulations, operational regulations, and monitoring and measuring regulations. So, the challenges lies in the procedural part, especially that the, 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 the reduction in hazardous waste management, reduction in chemical footprint, reduction new and upcoming uh, regulations, compliance. So those challenges are there. But see, these are the, the minimum requirement, and we have to comply with it. So these are the basic three uh, challenges in these three areas. West. While we are talking of challenges, let me bring in Grant as well. Grant, when it comes to process optimization and reliability of plant and equipment, what are some of the implementation challenges that you know large companies face, uh, you know, in India and around the world, for that matter? Yeah, thank you. Um, look, what we what we see, I guess, in the marketplace is um, the drying up of resources, the uh, quality resource constraint, uh, operating pressures to produce more as our lifestyles improve, as our standard of living improves. It puts a lot of pressure on assets, and uh, we find that we you know really sweating the assets quite a lot. So. We then turn to um, you know, start to ask ourselves questions of how do we uh, get more out of our existing assets? How do we actually elevate the standard? How do we get more throughput? How do we de-bottleneck? So we, um, we find that we, we start investigating data that we have and you know, discovering through data analysis uh, what might get, help us achieve more with the same assets. And these constraints uh, are also wrapped up with social license. You know, it, you can push your plant more, but you don't want to be putting more um, emissions into atmosphere and into water and, and these sorts of things. So, you know, it's, it's a real balancing act about trying to uh, achieve society's growth and society's improvement, as well as uh, as looking at uh, technologies that are, that are available. Right, um, absolutely. And uh, to add on to those challenges, uh, I think. One of the important ones is handling of chemicals. And let me bring in Abhinandan here. Uh, you know, what are the challenges, unique challenges, uh, as far as the supply chain and logistics of handling chemicals is concerned? It's quite different from handling any other product. Like, uh, uh, lay down the challenges in that regard for us, please. Yeah. Thanks, Pudu. Now, as we are saying, as we are moving from Atman Nirbhar se Bharat Pe Nirbhar, and the numbers what we are seeing today and the numbers what we are projecting in future, the business is really growing very high. And if you see the how our Indian uh, context, our mainly oil and uh, metal, mineral metals related businesses are towards the eastern coast. And all the chemicals related uh, business are towards <coughs> western coast. So a, a kind of hub is getting created in Western courts. So this is required when we are saying we need to export. So the ports are important uh, for the exports. But if you see we, uh, as a domestic market also, internal transports are also very critical. So what we are trying to say is ki when we are doing internal transports and external uh, exports, so the what type of transports are available today? So we say land transport air and water, these are the major things where we have the transportation facilities. And if you see in last few years, this transportation facilities are growing dramatically. So lots of challenges and we've laid those out on the table from ESG compliance to operational efficiencies to supply chain. Let's talk solutions now. And if I can come to you, Jagdish, first, um, give us a sense of how digital technologies can really help uh, in achieving ESG compliance in particular 
and sustainability in the long run. Most of the people, maybe the chemical plant or pharma, maybe the petrochemicals, okay? So while we uh, operate the plant, so what we need, we need the informations, okay? So uh, to run the plant, we need the monitoring, some parameter under the monitoring, some parameter under the control, some parameter under interlocks. So uh, initially when uh, business developed, we have two to three plant, but this plant size become to three to 30, then becoming that data become a very uh, important part. So uh, digitization the, is the uh, thought process we had, uh, we had implemented and we have the logbooks, we have the maintenance logbooks, operation logbooks, multiple parameters. So all the parameter maintaining by the people are, have the two problems. One is the, while people is managing, they are difficult to uh, maintain and make, make uh, difficult to maintain what they are doing. So uh, administrative control are, are the, build the people base. When we transfer the, all the controls and we get them the information uh, one level, then there is a use of the digitization. So parameter uh, from one plant to another plant is the platform where the IoT 4.0 is helpful to us. Uh, IIoT will going to be helpful to us. These are the one parameter with the gathering the information. Now, once we gather the information, then we also expect some output uh, from these parameters. Let me also then come to supply chain and logistics. And Abhinandan, uh, what are some of the modern digital solutions that uh, companies are using to overcome the blind spots when it comes to supply chain and uh, transportation of chemicals in particular? Yeah, now we discussed about the problems, now we'll discuss about the solutions. Um, when we say that now the business is growing and the volumes are growing, the volume that we are now thinking of, the tonnage of things to be packed in the warehouses and made ready for the transportations, and you need huge uh, resources to manage these uh, big volumes. So now the technology is really coming into picture. Now robotics, cobots, radio shuttles are being very widely used in the industries and, the, and they are still growing. Throughout the conclave, diverse room facilitated ongoing conversations on sustainable manufacturing, providing manufacturers and stakeholders with invaluable insights. These discussions covered a wide range of topics, including enhancing yield in the bioethanol process and exploring the smart manufacturing process of the Plex system alongside others. As we conclude the second episode of India Inc. on the Move, Sustainable Manufacturing, powered by Rockwell Automation, we eagerly anticipate the forthcoming sessions. The upcoming discussions will revolve around sustainable manufacturing, life sciences and strategies aimed at propelling India's growth in the manufacturing sector. Stay tuned as we continue to foster engaging dialogues and contribute to India's manufacturing advancements. Forbes India, CNBC TV18 present India Inc. On the Move, Sustainable Manufacturing, powered by Rockwell Automation. Focus. Ideate. Innovate. Enable.